This podcast is a 98 Studios production. This episode is brought to you guys by the 2024 Alchemy Excellence event. Today's the day, baby. Today's the day. Today's the day. Today's the motherfucking day. Today is the day. Today's the day. Today is the day. Today's the day. What up, what up, what up, everybody? Welcome back to Today's the Day with Zach Anderson. Today we have our special guest, Mr. Ryan Bayless. Ryan, thank you for coming out. Thank you for making the drive down here. I appreciate you big time. Um, For those of you guys that don't know Ryan Bayless, I guarantee you if you are on Instagram, so every (laughs) one of our followers... You have seen the ads for his company. He is the founder, co-founder of Drift, the car sense that look cool as shit. So not the ugly car sense. That's a Thanks. good way to describe it. Sure. Yeah, that's a go. better pitch than I could ever do. So yeah, you got <laughs> I like it. it. I like it. Well, dude, let's dive straight in. I've got a bunch of questions for you, but I guess kind of starting from the beginning, a little background on you, because I obviously don't know you prior to, to meeting you today and kind of going through a couple of things, but a little background on you, and then we'll dive into Drift and then the future and everything. Yeah, so I'm I'm Ryan, one of the co-founders of Drift. Um, before Drift, I was just working in marketing. Uh, my background's kind of in video production. Worked in outdoor. I was at Goal Zero for a, for a while. It was one of my favorite jobs. We got a good crew there working in the outdoor industry. Um, then I worked at Degreed, so a little SaaS product. We did uh, a learning management system. Okay. Nobody knows what that is unless you're in HR. Yep. <laughs> um, but it was it was fun. We had a good team there too, and fun brand to work on. And then. And we started Drift. So me and my me, my co-founder, Christian, That was 2016 it. that you did yeah, that with yep. Christian. That's awesome. Yep. And and when you say you were in marketing, what like what does that mean your role was? Yeah, so I was just in on the like creative side. So mostly working on mostly working on video. So video. at Degreed, I was doing all the video and we had like a YouTube series and and then I worked on kind of all the Very kind cool. of marketing videos. And content. coming into that, you grew up in Utah. Mm-hmm. Okay, good deal. And coming into that, did you plan on going into video? Was that like your dream, your goal? Yeah. Your passion through high school or when did that kind of... Yeah, so I learned how to make videos to kind of taught myself when I was like 15. This is like pre when it was easy. Yeah. So like it was hard back then. (laughs) You had to use like weird software and like you had to have a really a really fast computer that were hard to get. Like we'd go to CompUSA and like have to spec it out and build it ourselves Um, and kind of taught myself how to edit and, and do that. So I did like a bunch of the school videos, those type of oh, things. So- and then um, went to college. I was an econ major for, I don't know, 15 minutes. <laughs> and then I was like, screw this. And I switched to uh, broadcast journalism. So I graduated with a communications degree uh, oh, okay. at Utah State um, and a uh, minor in multimedia. And then th- that was the only video thing we had up there. Yeah. Um, so I obviously didn't do anything with the journalism side of it. But yep. I think a journalism degree is actually really interesting because I feel like you learn how to do qu- stuff very quickly. So you like have to like, just get things. Yeah, done you got to edit mean? quick. You got to tell stories quick, and I mm. think that part of it was really helpful and super cool to have in my kind of quiver. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I don't have like a business degree or anything like That's that. That's awesome. So. That's awesome. I yeah. love that. And then so, re- 2016, right? What What was like the birth of Drift? What was the yeah. the concept, the idea? How did that even come to be? Because I'm imagining myself. How old were you at the time? Uh, I'm mean, I'm easy. I was born in '90, so I was 26. Okay, 26 years old. That's yeah. me in in two years. Like I imagine myself like coming up with an idea and that is such an odd idea, right? And we were talking about it a little bit before. It's like the strangest avenue to Mm -hmm. go and you just kind of took it over. Like I remember, like I have seen your ads, I kid you not, so many times and you guys went and obviously blew it up and dominated it and you're in a really, really cool spot today that not very many companies would get to. Um, But it's such a strange thing. It's not your everyday average idea. Like where was it conceptualized? Where? How did this happen? Yeah, I think... I've always had like this weird brain of just like constantly thinking of these goofy ideas. Okay. Like I have probably 45 URLs of like businesses that I <laughs> want to start. Uh, Christian, who's my business partner on Drift, uh, I call him all the time. We rank our ideas by like dollar amounts. So I'll be like, bro, I've got like a $50,000 idea, you know, this okay. one, this one's a billy. You okay. know? <laughs> We've had a couple of those. There's a few people out there that are already doing them. So, you know, can't go, go do it. But, um, <laughs> Well, the original idea happened because, um, so I went and bought a used car. It was like sporty to me. It was a Mazda Speed 3. Back in the day, that was sick for me. Heck yeah. You know, you get torque steer because it's front wheel drive, but whatever. It was fun. And uh, I went and got it. This dude in Pocatello had it. Okay. So as you can imagine, if you don't know Idaho, Pocatello's got some funk to it probably. Yep. So (laughs) this car kind of smelled when I picked it up. Uh, Like a combination of things, I assume. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just... uh, 
what's the elf quote? Like you smell like beef and cheese. So yeah. <laughs> something like that. Um, Perfect. And so, but this car was like a big deal to me. It was my first like adult purchase. Yep. And I went to go get an air freshener for it. And I'm like, I don't want to put uh, the other guys. I don't know if I the can trees. say them. Well, can you say said them. it. You yeah, said the, it, not the me. The trees. Yeah, those I know guys, what you're saying. Yeah. Those small, small, uh, small uh, evergreens. Um, <laughs> So I, I was like, I just want something that's better than that. Like, I thought their scents were fine. Like, I grew up, you know, Black Ice or Vanilla Roma. Those were, like, the go-to yep. in high school. But Always. I wanted to graduate from those those scents and have something a little more sophisticated. Um, and so I was I, had, I was working a different job at the time, and I was like, I told somebody there, I'm like, hey, we should just come up with an air freshener idea. But I didn't do anything with it. This was, like, 2012. Got you. And um, so I just, you know, put it in the notebook, forgot about it. Um, and then 2016... Christian and I were on a hike and kind of just doing the uh, the thing you do, complained about your desk jobs to yep. each other. Yeah. And he was like, you got any good business ideas? I'm like, I got a bad idea. Let's sell air fresheners on the internet, you know? <laughs> and I told him about this idea of like a wood air freshener, something that's just different, something yeah. that looked, you know, was was more of an upscale look in your car. Because I think yep. it's funny, a car is the second most expensive thing that most of us buy mm-hmm. besides a house. And we kind of treat them like garbage. <laughs> we That's facts. Know, That's actually a really, really good point. You could see it. I've, you've seen this where there's like an Audi R8 with a little tree hanging on the visor. You're like, there's a disconnect here. You know, yeah, you 100%. bought that for a dollar. Because in your house, those same people are the ones with decor that is like perfectly planned. They hire someone to make sure everything 100%. looks great. Looks perfect. That's funny. hundred dollar candle. They got a I've never thought about that. You know, instead we've, we've just decided to like commoditize that thing. So yep. that was kind of the, the crux of it was like, okay, we need something that looks good and smells good. Yep. Um, and then I didn't think anything of it. And Christian had already, he'd already started running. So he got, he hated a, his job a little more than you, a little more than me. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. I like, I usually like my jobs, but gotcha. yeah, he was, he was working, uh, doing consulting and yeah, he was, uh, he was moonlighting doing our, our drift stuff. So he, uh, he got a membership at a wood shop and kind of figured out how to make them. And literally for the first two years of the business, he was doing them all by hand. No way. Yeah. So, so explain that to me then the process of like making them. Cause I guess, I guess they do, they look incredibly, they look incredible and you're so right. Like when you <laughs> in high school, the epitome of, of like, a little bit of swag was just have a car freshener in general. You're going to go on a hot date. You You're not having black, one. You got, you, you grab the black ice, you put it under every seat. Cause they look like shit. No offense. They look like shit, but that's so true. I would have them like stuffed under my seats yeah. literally. Yeah. And then yours really are. They look incredible. How do they work though? Like you got a, yeah. you got a membership at a wood shop and what just went and. Yeah. So we first tried to figure out like, how do we make sense? Neither of us have a fragrance background. We have no idea what we're doing. So we started using like essential oils. We found like beard oils that we like the scent of, and we just soak the wood in them. Yeah. Um, and we started to figure out how to do it with fragrance oils and buying some uh, stuff, but we always wanted to be clean because, you know, we're locked up in these aluminum boxes with no airflow. Like, I don't know what chemicals half yeah. these air fresheners are using and yep. I wanted to be super clean. So Originally, we even came up with this black list of things. We we didn't want to use phthalates, parabens, all the stuff that like endocrine, endo, I can't talk. Yep. You know what I mean? I know what the, you mean. The disruptors. The big words that you yes. don't like because yeah, you I'm can't not pronounce them. No, no, that's, I'm a, I'm that's a journalism how... major. That's it. So, um, you know, we want it to be free from all that crap. And um, so we always, you know, worked with the cleanest ingredients we could find. And so we just started figuring it out. Lots of, lots of Google, lots of, you know, making ourselves experts at it, um, mixing scents together. Um, originally it straight up looked like a breaking bad operation. Like, um, what's funny about scents is even if they're clean, they may have acidic properties. So the first day we were testing things out in like red Dixie cups. Yeah. And I think we mixed some, some lemon oil or something in one of them. Next day I come in and it's just corroded Spilled. the entire cup everywhere. I'm like, <laughs> like gasoline. Yeah. Oil. I'm like, what the <laughs> heck? And then I realized like citric acid is, is corrosive. So, um, you start to learn about like, okay, we need to put these in glass containers when we do it. Um, but originally, like when we started soaking them, we would do it in like big batches. And so yeah. we started out with like Pyrex containers where we'd soak the wood in them. And then we moved on to like fish tanks. Christian went and bought Walmart out of fish tanks. Cause we were having to soak so many pieces cause it kind of took off. That's awesome. And yeah, like if you straight up came into our warehouse originally, it was like, yeah, are you guys making air fresheners or meth? Like yeah. you can't tell. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we've gotten more sophisticated as we go, um, obviously, but, uh, yeah, originally it was just like... And when you're doing that, out of curiosity, just on, like, the mechanics of how it works, just yeah. straight up my curiosity, how do you make sure, like, 
what I would imagine would happen then if you're soaking this wood, and I apologize for my voice. I lost my voice, and I tell anybody who's listening, they've heard my voice normal, and I don't sound like this, so I apologize. It's all good. Um, I would assume you go and you soak it, you take it out, it's incredibly strong, and then mm-hmm. it goes away very quickly. Yeah. And, like, to be an effective car freshener, it has to last, be consistent, so right. on and so forth. How did you figure that out? Or, did it, like... Yep, yeah, fill me in. so we got lucky in a couple ways. One is you want to work with a certain type of wood that will uh, that's really absorbent for oils. So fragrance oils actually it's good because it's got the same viscosity generally as like oil wood that you would stain with. Yep. So you want a wood that would absorb oils good. So we actually started with cedar. We now use alder, um, but both of those have a really good like retention of oil, um, and certain scents would have different viscosity. So you would know. You have to kind of play with it a little bit, but yep. yeah, so we've, we've worked that out quite a bit cause you're right, but it's funny cause people, it's a little bit of a dichotomy. People want that scent to hit them in the face when they get in the car, but they don't want to get a headache from sitting in the car with it. Too. Exactly. So you want to know that it's there. Um, and we've played with it all along the way. So we do a, a scent of the month program and part of that is seasonality. We think that, you know, people want something that's plays along with the time of year, but they also want, uh, to avoid nose blindness. So, what nope. is that? That's where, you know, when you go on a trip and you come home and you're like, oh, that's what my house smells like. That's oh, nose yeah, blindness. Yeah. So you actually forget what things smell like. Your nose just doesn't smell it anymore. Yeah. Um, that happens in the car too with the air freshener. So a lot of times if it's not super strong or if it's a scent you're using consistently, you won't smell it anymore. Um, mm-hmm. So we always switch it out every month and it just works better for us. Yeah. yeah. Know, and it's for you fresher and as a customer. Like so yeah, it's awesome. So anyways, that was kind of a long no, that way was, of like, that was a really, figuring it out. That like, was a good answer. We like still that. just kind of like just winging it and starting to figure out like what sense we liked. Um, we always figured out the manly sense kind of the more masculine ones worked better for drift because it was, you know, it was a wood product. It was stone and it just had this cool look to it that, you know, those yeah. played well with. Um, but we also made floral sense. Some of my favorite scents are the floral ones. Yeah. But. And how did that, so you go and you start, you, you can, you conceptualize the idea he goes and starts working on these. Now you have a product and it works. Then what? Yeah. So we did a Kickstarter campaign and, uh, we didn't do it right. Like we didn't run ads. We didn't do any of that stuff, but we, we did it. We hit the goal after I put in like 3000 of my own dollars at the end, just to like kick it over. Just so to we get, get it there. You're like, so we get it there. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I don't know. We like, we both had real jobs at the time and we kind of just we shipped them out monthly. People bought 12 packs or they paid for like 12 months. Yeah. 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 And so we had to keep shipping them every month. And so gotcha. we built the website. We had no idea what we were doing on the subscription side, any of that. Um, but we just limped it through. Yeah. And I don't know, like halfway through we were kind of like, all right, maybe we get done with the 12 months and then, you know, we put a fork in it and call it good, you know, and that was, that yeah. was a fun learning experience. Um, why is that just because you didn't see the profitability? It wasn't yeah, it was hard. It, it was just a lot of work. It was hard. And I think we, you know, it was, it was, um, we were trying to solve a lot of problems within it of like, okay, is there scale to this? Um, and we were growing a little bit, like we had a couple hundred subscribers at that time. Yeah. And, um, but we were like, we probably need to like go get investment, um, which we ended up doing eventually. And, yeah. um, once we found our investor group, I think that was kind of the kind of kick out of the nest, so to speak of like, we kind of had to learn how to fly. And, Just because and now you owed people. Exactly. And I think they, they pushed us a lot. That was a big, you know, milestone for us. I think always along the way, because we were a subscription product, it was always a subscriber count that was always kind of like, okay, that's the next one. You know, when you break a thousand, then you break 10,000, you know, and you keep going every 10,000 was like, whoa, like, yeah, I'd I'd always just send Christian, Christian a screenshot and be like, dude, do you ever think we'd like get to this point? Like, no, like you don't. And, um, and not that I'm like pessimistic, but it is, it's it's one of those things. Yeah, for sure. The statistics are against you. Yep. So, um, 90, 90, 5% 5% against you. 100%. Yeah. Not yep. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 95% Correct. against you. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, uh, I think for me, uh, we, we had roller coaster moments. I, I do think, uh, we were in a good position because Christian and I are really good yin and yang. Mm. I think it takes a while to find a good business partner and make sure that you're like good to operate together. And yeah. definitely we piss each other off at, at moments. Yeah. But at this point, like, dude, we're like, a perfect marriage. So what is the yin and the yang then? Like, what are you? What is he? Well, for in the beginning, he was cheap. I'd spent, I I came from marketing. So I was really good at spending money, you know? So we like, (laughs) we like would fight back and forth of like what we were doing. And, um, and I think we always, it always worked itself out that way. And I think when one of us was down, one of us was up. So it was always like, you know, we always kind of pushed past the hard, hard points. Um, and we could, 
figure out any problem that came up because he kind of handled a lot of the operations side. Uh, at the time I had no idea how to do Excel. So I was just a marketer. <laughs> like I could yeah. make, I could make things that look pretty and sell it. Yep. And he was just so much better at the operations stuff. That's um, awesome. So that worked out really well for me and, and just complimentary skill sets. Yeah. Um, cause in the beginning and especially cause he had the kind of grit to go make the product yeah. for so long. I think we learned a ton that way. And, uh, it's still kind of made handmade. We have a couple suppliers and this is, it's like pretty, that's amazing. It's still, it's all U.S. made, uh, at least on the wood side. And it's super interesting. But it's very cool. So then yeah. you finally buckle down. At what point were you like, okay, I got to like, this is like our full time job now. Yeah. Like at what point did that happen? And then where did it go from there? Yeah, I think I can't remember the exact subscriber count, but I think we just passed like a thousand subscribers. So gotcha. we're not doing a ton in revenue, but we're like, okay, we've got a little bit of a, a it's. Uh, and our investors kind of came to us. And we're like, it's a go or no go. Like if you guys want more cash, like we want you in and going full time. And it's like, I don't know, like hard. It, I was hedging a lot because yeah. I'm like, well, if this fails, like I want, I, I mean, I, at the time I had a kid and like, yeah, I'm like, I may still have a kid, but you know, <laughs> I, I'm like, uh, there was some scarcity. Yeah. I'm like, I got a mortgage. I got to deal with this stuff. I don't want to, you know, f- if we fail, I got to go back to find another job, which I, I, I think I could. Um, but yeah, I didn't want to have to like take that risk. So I was like kind of hedging and then we just did it. And I mean, I think that's a huge, you know, when you jump on something like that, it's, you, you have to do it. So no option. Right. So then we kind of just took off from there. So, um, we were still in kind of the heyday of Facebook ads. Yeah. Um, you know, pre iOS issues. Um, so it was in hindsight, we should have gone and just got as many dollars as we could have and just pumped it in there. Yep. Um, we were acquiring a customer for like 10 bucks, which is insane. If you know anything about that now. Um, but yeah, we were just, we were just cranking off Facebook ads as you kind of mentioned before. Yeah, hundred percent. So yeah, we still guys, do, <laughs> but you guys still do. yeah, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of off to the races at that point. And yeah, I thought we had a, a cool product. that was super unique. At what point in like the business process for you, are you like, that is when you go dump, like you just said, we should have in hindsight dumped more dollars into marketing like is it when you have a proven concept is it when you have traction like when is it in the yeah, business cycle good question so i think two parts to it one on the testing phase you know and we've we've looked at this on on multiple product fronts now is i think because those um we were talking before the show about yep. how we fall for instagram ads all the time yep. oh yeah um that i think you should do it early for testing at least for because i think if you have product market fit that makes everything else so much easier right if people want it it, if you have one of those ideas going and doing, it's awesome, but you got to make sure that the market wants what you have. Cause yeah. otherwise it's stupid. That's yep. a, bad ideas are only just like people vote with the dollars. Yep. And if they're not going to vote with their dollars, don't do it. Yep. So I think you can early on, if you want to really test something, go build a dummy Shopify site that just grabs an email, but you want people to like buy, even if you don't have the product ready, just make sure they buy it. And then you can like refund it or something. But like, go see if people click an ad and then go put it in their cart and then buy it. What's your actual purchase rate? Because if mm. it's, if they're not going to actually buy it, a click's worth nothing, right? Yep. So I think in the early days, you can still do that. But I think for us, you know, making sure that people like the product, we got feedback from the early Kickstarter people of like what they liked, what they didn't and yep. all the scents and stuff like yep. that. Um, and we've always tried to iterate around the scent. <laughs> the product's basically the same as it was the the clip itself is v1 like it was literally drawn on a napkin which is amazing yeah my friend uh norm that i worked with at goal zero he drew it up on a napkin at toasters one day at, at the outdoor retailer show and i think we're using that same design that's um, great but uh yeah i think i think from a marketing perspective I, I don't know i i come from the brand world and i think what's funny about our ads was i would spend all this time like making these cool ones and stuff like the best performing ad we had for like the first four years of the business was a screenshot from our Kickstarter video. Like this garbage, garbage screenshot worked the best because it looked unnative, you know, yeah. it looked like it was like, what, what, what is this? I don't know what this is. I'll click it. And then mm. be like, Oh, okay. It's a cool air freshener. Nice. Mm-hmm. And then that helped us through the sales process. But, um, I kind of had to throw out a little bit of my, my pickiness around <laughs> brand uh, when it comes to ads. Well, it's so. because it's because, one in my opinion it, like that that just shows branding is an art form not a science uh-huh. right and like when you're so used to we just had Corey Sistrunk on here and he's a genius with this stuff he's amazing when you're so used to a, a certain type of brand working in a certain 
industry or space or whatever it may be and you get into a new space, a totally different type of brand could work for that space. For sure. And I can imagine, especially if you're so, I mean, the cre- just creative people in general, anyone who's in marketing and like devoted to it, like they're incredibly particular because they like what they like. And then they see that they like what they like works in a certain market. I can only imagine coming out of that and having to go a totally different direction. That would be, that, that's an incredible. So then after that, right, you get some traction, you get going, it starts blowing up. It's now your full-time gig, right? How does the scale go from there? Do you guys go and scale rapidly? Is this over a long process? Are there big changes or is it just really kind of like a compounding thing or what, what is it in this yeah, situation? I mean, honestly, we've grown pretty consistently since then. So we've just constantly pumped dollars into, into growing it through uh, user acquisition yep. and, and paid user acquisition. Um, and mostly through Facebook and Instagram ads has always been our biggest channel. Yep. Um, but yeah, and, and word of mouth too. Like once people get it, I think it's a cool product. It's very giftable. So we do really, really well around holidays and, um, you know, your kind of typical holidays, Valentine's, yep. Father's yep. Day, Mother's Day. We do really good around those just cause it's super unique. Yeah. Um, and I think the look of it always helped us on the marketing side. Cause it was like, Hey, what is that? So yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not like your typical thing. Always showing it in use was a great thing for us. People were like, what is that? Oh, got it. Cool. Yep. Um, I didn't know I needed that, you know? Yeah. So, and then as you're setting goals, as this process goes, are your goals like, okay, we need to go hit 5,000 subscribers. We need to do this. And how did that go? Were you guys on track? What were some speed bumps you hit or what were some things where you went and dominated even more than you thought? And then obviously leading up to where you guys are at now, you're in a very, very cool spot and a very unique spot. And not many companies that start get there. 90, I believe it's mid nineties percentile fail. Yeah. Right. Which is crazy, but it makes a lot of sense. So yeah. So fill me in there. No, I think it was always subscribers. We were, you know, we are, uh, we're kind of the perfect subscription product because you and I may drink, we were talking about liquid death. Yep. You and I may drink liquid death differently. So if you yep. want to subscribe to it, it's a little wonky because I might want, I might drink two a day. You might drink one. Yep. So our consumption model is different with uh, air freshener. It fails at 30 days. It's like perfect planned obsolescence. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a feature, right? Yep. Um, uh, so I think uh, the subscription model always worked for us. We're still like 95% subscription That's over e-commerce. Crazy. That's um, so crazy. So it, it works really, really good for us. So that was kind of always where we were, were going. But with subscription businesses, what you don't look at, what, what you don't think about as much is churn. So you're constantly looking at how many people Turnover, are leaving. Yeah. And gotcha, so at gotcha, some gotcha. point, at some point, you're always you're always starting negative within a month. So yep. whatever your churn your churn rate is, you start with that against you. Yeah. So even if you're growing, call it just for easy math, ten percent, but your churn's five percent, you've got to grow fifteen percent. Yep. So yep, yep, yep. you know it's uh it's an interesting game that you have to play a little bit, but yeah, it's also uh for us, I don't have to go get if I have a hundred subscribers, I now don't have to go get those hundred. I just need to stack on top of it. So it's a really cool compounding thing. Yeah. But it presents a whole new slew of problems too. So then you're, you're getting to the point where it's healthy. You guys are running with it, all of that. And now like fast forward to now, you guys have been acquired, which is incredible. Like that's like, if you look at businesses, that's really kind of the the cycle of it. Eventually mm-hmm. to go scale past a certain point, a company gets acquired, they raise or they go public. Yeah. Right, in the IPO. So how was that process? How has it been different than you expect? Has it been better, worse, all, all of the above? That's yeah. I'm asking. Yeah. So we, um, a couple of years ago, we were like, Hey, let's just go see what's out there in terms of an acquisition. So we had brokers that kind of went out and pitched the business for us. Um, and we found some people, you know, some, we'd almost sold it once, um, had a term sheet, started figuring it out and we almost went for it and then didn't, you know, it didn't work out. Um, and so we did it again and we had a few suitors, you know, we talked to a bunch of different types of businesses from, kind of private equity to like these Amazon conglomerates. It was like 2020, 2021. So there was a lot of people buying businesses at the time. And uh, we always wanted a strategic buyer because we like our business. (laughs) So, you know, we didn't build this thing for an exit necessarily. We just had a cool concept. We obviously we want to do something with it. You don't just do this for fun. You do, but you know what I mean? Yeah. You want to make some money out of it. It's kind of your baby. Yeah. But at the same time, like I really genuinely love our brand and you want it to go to a good steward. And we said that from the beginning when we started pitching the sale, we're like, we want to sell it to, we don't want to sell the soul of this thing. We actually genuinely love the community we built. We think it's a really cool product. Let's try to find a strategic uh, buyer. So we talked to a few businesses um, and, so early on in Drift, like 2017, one of our investors, he 
sent us this company. He's like, hey, I've been subscribing to this for a while. It's actually really cool. It's called Scentbird. You can subscribe and get on body fragrances so you can try out like oh cool you want to try any high-end ds and durga or like one of these cool fragrances you get a trial size mm. like a little travel size that then you get a trial for the month and they send you new ones every month so i actually ended up signing up for it i wasn't necessarily like a fragrance guy like i put cologne on my wife's like who are you putting that on for i'm like me i'm doing it for me <laughs> uh but i actually started to love it and you could try out all these different scents and from a drift side we were like man they're doing some cool stuff they you know, we, I'll be honest, we stole some ideas from them back in the day. Everybody. Does. Yeah, right. And uh, so we, I tell them that now, which is hilarious because they ended up buying us. But um, they put like a card in there with like the scent of the month notes and all that. We're like, that's a sick idea. So we stole it. Yep. And uh, yeah, so we pitched them, sent them the the uh, the kind of deal and and they were interested. And I'll admit the due diligence process if, in any of that is not fun. Yeah. Uh, it's an absolute roller coaster. Every other day you're like, okay, deal's getting done. Deal's not getting done. These formalities and, and uh, all I, we, to be honest, we had very little skeletons. Like we had cleaned up our books to make sure they were, you know, above board. I mean, we were always above board, but like you want to make sure your accounting is really dialed, that all yep. your operations is really dialed. Yep. You're really transparent in everything you do. And I think a lot of businesses aren't, especially small teams like us, we were a team of like five people. Yep. Um, when you're not that big, you don't that'll blow a deal up. Oh, for sure. And, yep. and you don't look, I mean, we're, you're talking enterprise, le- somebody that's enterprise levels buying you and you're like a little mom and pop shop. We, we, you know, we were, again, we were doing things better than most, you know, it's not like we had paper accounting or something Yeah. like we were, we were really dialed. So that helped us out a lot, but I still think you're constantly in this flux of like, man, everything's out on the table. Yep. You know, yep. there's all these terrible business metaphors of like opening a kimono, but like, those are the things like ep- literally everything's out there Yeah, and we got to figure out a way to make this work. And yep. so, yeah, every other day it was like uh, an absolute anxiety roller coaster. And um, how long was that process? Uh, I think our first uh, email to Semperd was in like February mm-hmm. and we closed in October. So yeah, it was, Got you. yeah, that's it, a, it's a lifetime when it, in is that when you lost your hair? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, you can I'm make fun of that. Shit. We're good. We shit. know. Yeah. yeah. This, this, this we episode talk. is sponsored by keeps. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Don't take that stuff. It gives you just read the side effects. They're all real. <laughs> I can read them really fast. I'm I didn't have all of them. Dear internet. I did not have all of them, but definitely some of them. I'm glad you clarified yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> the main one I didn't have as much of a problem with. <laughs> okay, good. So that that process just a just a ball of stress and, and anxiety, and I totally understand that. Any type of negotiation process, not ahead. that smooth, or not that unsmooth though. I will say, like we had it pretty good because of still, because of what you guys had already. done. Yeah, I think so. I think, and we had great brokers that had done it before. So that, like, to be honest, with the deal before, we had tried to do it ourselves, and I'm glad we had some expertise in our good. corner because we don't have. Neither of us are MBAs. Your broker was like negotiating and and yeah, helping us out a little bit with that stuff and you know making sure we had all the the right you know ducks in a row. Cool. Um, And and again, they've gone through it, so they know they know where they could push and and not. And I think that helps out a lot. Obviously, that costs you money in in part of the deal, but that's okay because in in reality, it was worth it for us. Hundred percent. Um, but yeah, so it was it was uh yeah, like I said, a roller coaster. But when it was done, it was like. Really cool. What was that feeling when it's like done? It's like sign on the dotted line, and once it's signed, you can't go back because there's all like it's yeah. like done. What uh, was that? Did you guys have a party? Did you just go no, home and freaking was, lay down and be like, "Thank <laughs> God"? Or what? Yeah. Or, or were you like, "Damn!" Like, was that the right move? Like, what was for the, sure? What was the, all of that? What up, everybody? Thank you guys for listening. Today's show is brought to you guys by the Alchemy Excellence 2024 event. I want to tell you guys a little bit about that, and then get you guys a discount for that. Um, but the Alchemy Excellence event, it's coming up. It's January 23rd and 24th. For those of you guys that are wanting to start your year off huge, anyone who's in sales and recruiting, owns a business, whatever it may be, the, the lineup of speakers is incredible. We have Todd Peterson confirmed, Kelsey Wells, Doug, myself will be, will be presenting, um, Jason Shaw, Casey Baugh, Jimmy Rex, Jeff Mendez. The, the list is amazing, and that's only some of the speakers. Um, it'll be a, a little, a short two-day event absolutely worth your time again if you're trying to go and start your year off right these are the type of events that put you in proximity with the people who will push you to the next level Um, and even if you're dominating if you're on an absolute roll it never hurts to go and get a little bit better so mark it on your calendars it's the 23rd um, and 24th and then use the code early bird 24 for 50 percent off your tickets Um, i strongly encourage anybody 
anybody, anybody, anybody who wants to have a big 2024 to go and get your tickets. And I'd love to see you guys there and to chat about the podcast and everything else. So I'll see you guys in January. Until next time. Hey, what's up, guys? I want to take a second to thank today's sponsor for the podcast. Um, the dudes who run this company are some of the coolest dudes that I know. The company is killing it. Um, and I've personally used the product multiple times. But the sponsor today is King Cool Plunge. They make the best local cold plunges that I've ever, ever used. And those of you guys that know me, you know I love to sauna, I love to cold plunge, and they absolutely kick ass. So make sure you go check out King Cool Plunge on their website. That's K-I-N-G-K-O-O-L-P-L-U-N-G-E dot com. Um, and use code TTD for $350 off. Okay. Yeah, so I was, I was, it's funny, I was, uh, I, I don't remember what day it was, but it was, it was the, it was the first of October, and I was, we just bought a house that we were remodeling and I was at the house, like doing some demo and it hit. And I was like, I thought it was really cool, but I had that thought of like, could we've gotten more yeah. or like, did we need to do that or yeah. like what? But at the same time, like, and, and, you know, we're a year into the acquisition and, um, as we were going through the process of selling the business, everybody comes out of the woodwork and tells you, all these horror stories and yep. everybody you know, wants to give advice to us. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And you, you hear these people of like, oh, you're going to be there for three months because they'll hate what you're doing. And everybody says they're not going to change the thing, but they're going to change everything. Um, and it wasn't that bad. It's yeah. honestly been amazing. We found a really, really great partner. Um, the team's awesome. Maria, who's the CEO at Semperd, like she is so awesome in the fragrance world and just dialed in and wants to grow the business. She's one of the most amazing motivators I've ever met too. She's okay. like really good as like a coach. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I, I really like working with that entire team and they've helped us. Um, I, we were mature as a brand, but man, we have moved into this whole new realm and completely blown out of wa out of the water. Like what we thought we could do. Yeah. In terms just of because growth. of the, the resources at your, yeah. at your yeah. disposal and resources and just, um, kind of just buttoning up of things that we weren't so good at like mm. development. They have an amazing development team mm. and uh, that's helped us out a ton. Cause before, you know, we had one or two people that would help us stuff would take forever to get done. And I was kind of running the Shopify side, which I absolutely, there's no person that should be in code less than me. <laughs> and so everything that broke was always my fault probably. Um, so that team's been absolutely incredible. And yeah. And, and resources wise, they also have this amazing fragrance background yeah. that, they've just helped so much around, yeah. you know, how we do on the development side and, and how we grow it. And yeah, yeah the sky's kind of the limit now. So that's amazing. And you said something I want to touch on. It. I don't want to blow past it before I start asking the rest of the questions. You said something like, Oh, we back when, when, when you started ordering their stuff in 2017, their scent bird stuff, you started stealing ideas from all of that. And like, might be like stealing ideas. Like people hear that and they're like turned off. They don't think so. Everything's already been done. Sure. Right. And I think a lot of people, especially my friends who are like, oh, I want to own a business. I have a lot of friends and a lot of people in my life that are like, oh, I want to own a business. And they're like waiting for this idea that's like revolutionary, like the wheel. And it's like, frankly, dude, there have been billions of people for hundreds of years thinking up ideas. All you really need to do, and this gets talked about in a lot of business books, right? Nail it and scale it. Tony Robbins talks about it. Really, all you need is an idea. You need to improve it by 20%, and then you need to go for it. Yeah. Right? And marketing is a key. There's a lot of little keys to it, but 20% better sells. Sure. Right? And that you're probably more than 20% better than your competitors, but really, you took an idea that's been done. Like, yeah. Like, in zero negative way, has, sure. have you got, like, it's all been done, right? Yeah. You just did it. And made it look a little bit better or a lot a bit better, right? And then you marketed it better and then you just executed better. But it's not new. Like a no. car freshener has been thought of. Make For your sure. car smell good. That's been done. Right. Right. And I think that's a really, really important piece because everyone who comes on here, they talk about their businesses. They started and all of them. If you go back and watch any episode or talk to anyone that started a business, it's it's probably an idea that had been had and they just went and improved it. I think it's really, really important. What would you have to say on that? Because a lot of people will like not start their business because it's not this insanely new idea for sure. Right. And I mean, I guess if we could help someone kind of see through that lens, it would, it would. Yeah. I think, so I love Clayton Christensen's jo Christensen's jobs to be done. So I think with a product, you start to look at like the actual base level from a psychological thing of like, what do I want to accomplish? And for us, it's like for the car, it's like, I just want it to smell better. Right. So, yep. but we also add in a few caveats to that. Like, yeah, the other our competitors do the job 
just as good. Yeah. But we wanted to make sure it was like actually fragrances you like and he- like in an aesthetically pleasing way. Yep. And again, like I don't want a thing hanging from my mirror. I just don't like, yep. I think these cars are built in a way that like they're supposed to be aesthetically pleasing. They look cool. Those things detract. So we wanted it to be something a little better to your point on. Yeah. Anything just go look at it. And if you can improve upon the design, obviously without infringing on patents or something like that, yeah. then then go for it. Yeah, yeah, I think that like that's that's all that this is. is everything is a remix, right? A hundred percent. It reminds me of a really cool star- story. And sorry to, to ramble a little yeah. bit, but I remember I was listening to Jeff Curl speak, who started Stance Socks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who was exactly. a sock sock of the NBA, all that. And when he speaks about it and tells a story, I'd love to have him on the podcast. Um, he explains he literally was like, "I'm going to start a business." And I need to find something to make better. And he said he went and walked around. I think it was Target or Walmart or something. And he just walked around with a notepad and a pen. Or, and he was just making a list of things that were, like, boring. Yeah. Because he also had a big part in Skull Candy, which what they did was they took headphones. Anyone who snowboarded knew Skull Candy, right? They took headphones. They made them cool. Like, they made them dope, right? And all the snowboarders had them, so you had to have them. And they weren't any better quality headphones than any other headphones I had ever had. But you needed Skull Like, my, that was my junior high years. You needed Skull Candy. And anyone from my time period, will know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's what he did. He wrote down this list and narrowed it down, narrowed it down, narrowed it down, and finally ended on socks. He's like, I can find beige, black, brown, blue. Yeah. Right? And white. Yep. And he's like, I'm going to go make this, like, dope. And he literally went and just, like, <laughs> and stand socks are great. Like, they're, it's not like sure. they're, they're, they're not quality. high quality. They're great. They're great socks. But really, at the end of the day, it's like, how much better is the quality? Not that much better than a Nike or another pair of socks or all these other socks, but they blew up like stance was one of those same things where it became like you were cool based on your socks which is right like that's ridiculous to me yeah and i feel like you guys did the exact same thing in a way like you literally did you found in an industry where it's like kind of a given probably 50 plus percent or more people have a car uh freshener in their car and you guys just went and made it look cool and it's like i remember like seeing the ads i was like that's like cool like it yeah. would be cool to have that and i'm pretty positive I ordered one of your very early, like, kits. I don't remember. I think it came in a kit. I'm trying to remember way back and where it would even be. But because it was, like, it was, like, cool factor. It was cool to have that. And it's a freaking car freshener. Right. But it's so true. It's such a cool, like, I love breaking it down with you because it's, like, that's that's so cool to see kind of how you guys did it, how you thought about it. And then also to show you don't have to have some crazy and again, not, zero offense because what you guys have done is amazing, but it's not like it's, you guys... I joke. It's the world's worst elevator pitch. <laughs> you like, know where the worst place to sell fragrances online? Yeah. Like, can you smell it? No. I have to I have to just <laughs> like... Can. Yeah. And like, we've learned a ton with that. Like, we, we know that That's like so true. name and storytelling are like the two most... And, and photography, like yeah. those three things combined are the only way we can pitch it to you. So we are, we are like, that's our focus is like, we are really good at telling a story with the fragrance. That's the worst. You I guys, can't, you, like, you don't know, like, and also like a vague name. You're never going to know what it smells like. Yep. yep. You know, like, f- I'll tell you but what, But I though. can tell you fresh laundry and instantly in your head, you just smell you fresh You know exactly laundry. what it is. Yeah. Exactly. When some phone releases 4D technology. Yeah, exactly. We're and you can smell it. You guys, like, that's, let me buy some of your stock because yep. that's through yeah, the there we That's go. amazing. So you came up with the idea. That's, that's a given. You're, you're creative. Like, you're a genius in that. that but it was field. nothing. Yeah, well, exactly. It was a line on a notebook. Exactly. Until, Christian was like, that's what I was going to say too, right? So Kip, no, no, that's amazing. You're absolutely right. Then Christian went and just started it. But at some point you dove all in and maybe that was your investors forced it. But my question is, even though they forced it, you had an option to just be like, no, dude, this, this is not worth like, I've got a kid, I've got a mortgage. Like, yeah, there's way too much risk there. There's a 95% chance I fail. Yeah. Frankly, based on all of the data. Right. So it's like, where do you pull that courage from or who gave you that insight or who gave you the advice that got you there? Or was there someone or was there an idea? Like where, where, where was your breakthrough in life to be like, yeah, like when that time comes, I'll be ready and I'll do it. Cause a lot of people don't. Yeah. I I mean, it's hard. Cause like, even when I pitched the idea to my parents, I'm like, Hey, I think we're going to quit and go all in on this. My parents like great, awesome people, like very, very like, um, I mean, my mom's a, my mom was a teacher and then she was a school administrator. My dad's an accountant. Both of them worked like for the state and stuff, like very comfortable jobs. Yep. Great 401ks, I'm sure. Yep. But when they were like- That's their generation. Yeah. And they were like, so what about insurance? I'm like, well, figure it out, you know? And so I think you have to have a little bit of that tenacity and, and, you know, and that's okay if you don't have that too. I have friends that like, we talk about this where they're like, I couldn't do that because 
it feels too risky. I'm like, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, and to be honest, I am prone to anxiety. Like I am an yep. anxious person. Yep. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and tell you I have perfect mental health because if starting a business, what, what everyone wants to, you said that, like I, all my yeah. friends, everybody wants to do it. It's, it's not the like green grass that you think it is either. It's all day, all night. Christian was, when we were doing two jobs, he was leaving the one job, going to the wood shop, making stuff till like eight, 9 PM at night. Then we were shipping it. I was staying up till one or two, just running Facebook ads. Like it's not, it's not always like Kush. Yep. And I, yep. like, I, I will say like, we joke our, our book wasn't crazy because we didn't have like tons of like these gnarly negative moments we had a few though like where we thought the original thing was we thought we could ship them usps with just a stamp yeah you can't do that <laughs> you can you can when you're only shipping like 20 yep but then we showed up with a big bag of them and, and the post office immediately handed them back and we're like yeah no yeah and like this this is a this is a first class package you have to ship it for two dollars we're like we're running the math in our heads we're like that's not gonna work You're like that eats at 20 percent of our margin I'll try, try like 50 yeah. yeah so we were like oh that's not gonna work so we and we we had to find a workaround but uh for for anyone like wanting to do it you have to have some level of risk um and you kind of have to ignore the naysayers i i think too you know you kind of have to feel like you have a, a parachute but what's funny about the hedging yeah. thing uh the the irony of all that was if I would have stayed at my job, most of the team I worked with got laid off like two months later. That's so I'm crazy. like, so I'm like, you know, it not, and I don't know, maybe I was part of that. Maybe I wouldn't have been, but that team, that business kind of shrunk right after I left yeah. and not, you know, I was only there for a second, but it was like the, the, I mean the less, yeah, the lesson there, the lesson there is, and you're spot on. Not everybody's going to go start a business. Not everybody even really wants to. They might say they want to. And some people don't even say they want to. So this yeah. isn't really for them. This is more so for those people who are there on the edge. Yeah, like they yeah, want to yeah. do it. They have the whatever it may be. But even there, like, and that's probably one of my favorite things you've said so far. Like, that team, like, not my favorite thing because I feel for those that got yeah, let for off. Sure, that sucks. Yeah. I apologize. But, like, there's risk in everything. 100%. Like, there's risk even if it's not getting laid off or even if it's, and the way that I've kind of approached things, thank God for the people in my life to give me this perspective is like, even though it may not be like a, like a, you, 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 you get fired, have no money or broken homeless risk in your everyday job. The risk is just, you go through the motions. You don't like it. You go on hikes specifically to talk shit about your desk job. Yeah. Right. And that's where you spend so much of your life. And then by the time you're ready to like retire, it's like, soured your life so much you can't really go enjoy it and hopefully that's not the case for you but if it is understand that's also risk right like there's risk in everything and what i do like my job specifically it's like there's a ton of risk you could go do what i do work incredibly hard and literally make zero dollars we're a hundred percent commission just like a business is yeah hundred percent commission it's value creation you get paid on that that's it right there's risk in the other side of things too which i think is super 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 important so like whatever you believe in destiny, God, whatever it may be, like, that's a really cool moment for you to be like, Oh, wow, maybe I was acting in alignment and doing what I should have been doing, which is freaking cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And then you say you, you're like, you're an anxiety prone person. How do you deal with that through everything? Because that's another like, ex yeah, I would call it like a straight up excuse. I think we've been soft and it's like, Oh, no, like, dude, yes, you can have anxiety and these other things. Absolutely. It is an excuse at the end of the day, whether you're going to give it power, or not give it power, which clearly you haven't, which is super inspiring. Like, I think that's really important as well for people to realize people sitting in your position in your seat aren't just a different breed. And for me, that was really crazy to notice. I, would, I remember I'd go hang out with with Casey Barr, Todd Peterson, and I would like realize after like a year of knowing these guys after like the fear of like, holy crap, it's these guys who do all of this. Like that went away and I dropped my guard and they dropped their guard. And I'm like, dude, that's just like a normal dude. They're winging it. Yeah. I'm like, everybody's dude, winging. That's it. just a normal dude. Yeah. And I think that's really important to realize. And normal dudes have problems. They have family lives. They have yeah. issues. They have anxieties. How do you go and, like, work through and navigate that while also going and scaling something that's probably the biggest machine to create anxiety of anything you could sure. do, arguably? Yeah, I think, like, I think we're finally at a stage where we can all talk about mental health, which is cool. Yeah. So I would definitely go get help. Like, everybody should go talk yeah. to somebody. Everybody should, if you need medication, take it. Like, that's fine. I don't think we're, I don't think anyone's, you know, there's no below that anymore. Like, I think everybody, yep. like, we're all good with that, yep. hopefully. Um, and if not, you should go do that. Yep. Um, for me, like my, I've learned my biggest thing is like exercise. Like if I can go ride my bike 
for an hour every day, an hour and a half. Just go. Uh, I live by Mill Creek, so I go up Mill Creek Canyon yeah. on my bike like every day. I try to, and um, I do some sauna time. And, I love it. Uh, read lots of books. Like um, I've tried to turn tech off sometimes and and do that. So for me, that's like like, like my big escape. Play with my kids when I can. Yeah. Um. And and I've always been. Uh, I th- I'm probably more European when it comes to like work, but I'd rather work end up being for my life. You know, yep. I work, I don't live to work. I work to live Yep. and I don't, I want to, my kind of whole ethos with life right now is like, yeah, I'm still in a bit of a build phase, but I want to enjoy like while I can, I don't want to get to the end of my life where I can't do things anymore and then try to like, you know, exactly. do all the trips. I want to live it up right now. Yeah. Little eat, drink and be merry. Well, in my, 30s and 40s while I'm like active like I just got my kids ski stuff because I want to instill that love I I don't know you said snowboarding like that was my life yeah. from like age I don't know 12 to to 18 even through college a little bit like that's what I did I lived for that I mean, otherwise winter is pretty miserable here in Utah but 100 um so I want to instill that in it. my kids but also that's just fun time with them yeah um but yeah I want to try and like be uh, I, my parents were really great. They were around a lot, but they both worked. So, yep. um, and I think I want to be less so of the like nineties movie dad that like, you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger showing up late to the the play yeah. and then he doesn't end up with the turbo man. At all. <laughs> um, I want to be there and, you know, hopefully being more engaged with my kids. Um, and again, like my parents were great. I'm not, not you know, they were, they were awesome and still uh, just, and it's just different grandparents. generations. Totally. hundred percent. And I think I just want to parents probably grew up in the great depression or yeah. their grandparents. even. And they right? were the hardest workers. And, exactly. and they, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to, they, they were, they had, they had a whole different ball game that they were playing with. So, you know, my, my grandpa like worked two jobs day and night, you know, so he wasn't around very much, but he had built yeah, the foundation for that family and, yep. and for us. So, um, yeah. Anyways, I think that's like my, my whole reason for doing that. So back to the mental health thing, like, I want to have a balance with that. And I'm, I'm not going to not admit that a lot of that's privilege as well. So like yeah. I'm, I'm in a, a good place now with that. And hopefully, you know, this, we, we always wanted to bring people along with us as we did it too. I'm, I'm assuming you don't think you did everything perfect. Yeah. Right? No, and, I, and I don't no, even, at all. In, in any sense, I'm saying mentally within your family, within the business, like what could you have done better looking back now without depriving yourself of the situation you're in currently? Yeah. Christian and I are pretty retrospective. Like we were talking about this like two days ago and I think because we quit our jobs and because we were trying to impress our parents or something too, we focused a lot around like legitimizing the business at some points where we're like, oh, we need desks and we need like an office. And like, uh, <laughs> I'll I, bet you 10 bucks. You don't even sit at a desk when you do your work. I do now, do but you? it's in my, it's in my basement. It's like, it okay, doesn't cool. matter. And like, we're all remote. Semper's fully remote. And like we, we wasted so much time like doing that stuff and like trying to make it legit when who cares? Like, yeah. Did we need to go to Ikea that day and build those desks? No. And that was more on me. I think that I just felt like we needed to build a cool culture. I'm a culture guy. Like I want it to be fun to work yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Um, and this was pre COVID. So, you know, everyone came into our office, so we wanted to make it fun in a, a fun environment. But then at the same time, like it doesn't matter. <laughs> like yeah. we spent a lot of time on the operation side too, trying to like dial things in there and we should have spent it more on the growth side, I think. Yep. Um, and, and just keep making sure that we are shipping product in a correct way, but we didn't need to go spend time on that. So yeah, to me, it's like, I don't know, don't go print business cards, take that extra 20 bucks. You just gave Vista print and freaking spend it on an ad, you know, do, do where it's going to grow. Do things business. that move the needle rather than they move your image to hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, and at, at its essence, correct me if I'm wrong, what I get out of that is like, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. No. Right. And if you're allowing that to govern your decisions and you're trying to go start a business, you're bent over already. Right. right? That's that's the last thing you should do because you're going to get advice from a bunch of people who never did what they wanted to. So they're going to try and tear you down from doing what you want to do. It's, I mean, crab crabs in a, in a bucket. It's. Yeah. I, I don't know. I still, I still look at some of those like ego boosting things where I'm like, from a marketing perspective, I'm like, I know what direct response does. Yeah. So I'm like, why are we, some of these brand level things, I'm like, seems like a, seems like a real big uh, ego tickle that you (laughs) are advertising at a certain place. And Um, everyone's guilty of it too. Like it's totally normal. No, like I want, I want to, you know, uh, I, I'm, I don't want to get too specific here. I have a very specific thing I'll tell you offline, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to start calling shade out here, but I'm like, that's fair. you don't need to advertise there. Like nah, that seems it. like, that seems like a, the wrong audience you're advertising to. But yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes I'm like those types of things. Again, we, 
as people just like those and it's significant. you want to prove something. Yeah, it gives but a significance. But it doesn't matter at the end of the day, like your balance sheet, your yep. your your P&L matters more than, than anything else. And honestly, so. how you feel about yourself. And if you're 100%. constantly worried about what other people think, you're never going to feel good. No, for There's sure. There's always someone doing it bigger. I love that. So my last question, I want to be respectful of your time. Obviously, these fly by every time it blows my mind. My last question would be, how do you define success now versus how you used to define it? Yeah, uh, to me, it's just like freedom of time. And I don't, um, I was at jazz game the other night, lower bowl, but up high. And I'm looking <laughs> at Ryan down there and I'm like, Ryan Smith. And I'm like, it's gotta be crazy. Yeah. Cause I mean, we sold, but like pennies compared to that guy. And I'm like, what's that gotta be like to all of a sudden have, you know, you're literally a billionaire. Like that's crazy. Like you, your kids, your grandkids and their kids Set. couldn't spend enough. Literally to spend it. Yeah. you can do anything. And I, um, again, I'm a little different, I think I'm, and, and I'm not built different, but I'm just, I just don't have the same aspirations on terms of scale. I think I just want to provide a happy life for my family and make it comfortable and just enjoy it. Cause I think to me, uh, last year I started reading a lot about death. I don't know why, but like, for some reason I was and maybe this spiraled into my thing, but knowing Western culture is so funny cause we are so disconnected from death. You go to a developing country and death's kind of all around. And yep. it's something that you think about on the daily. I think that's a good thing. And there's a lot of books out there that talk about this, where it's like, if you can remind yourself you're going to die, like literally all of us, there's one guarantee. Like, that's it. You're going to die. You were born. Now you're going to die. We don't know when that day is going to come. Yeah. And so for me, I want to maximize. Um, my mom always had this poem that was called The Dash. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of all about, you know, you're, you got your birth date and you got your death date and, but it's, how do you live that dash? Mm -hmm. And I want my dash to be, you know, a good one. And to me, these resources that I've now acquired, I think will help with that. And I want to help other people as well, but uh, especially my family, um, to be able to have more time with them, to enjoy that time with them and like kind of live that dash up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Cause I don't, I don't need that. that you're, you're a hundred percent right though. Once you get there, you're like. I don't know. I've always said I don't. I don't need PJ private jet money. You yeah. Know? I don't need the yacht money. Yeah. I told Christian that from the beginning. That's not me. I just like I'm like wearing like this. This is cheap. I actually think this is a demo sweatshirt that I, like I got. It. You know, like, I like whatever. It. I don't care about that stuff. And uh, I want to continue that. I don't think I want to change a lifestyle again. We didn't sell for crazy multiples or whatever. So it's not yeah. like it, it was. Was it life changing? Yes. But is it? you know, to where I'm going to completely change lifestyle. No. And I don't want to, I want to live a more rounded life. I just yep. bought a bunch of stuff to do sourdough bread. Yep. I'm going to do that. You're going to make I'm, some sourdough. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm going to freaking, I'm going to garden. <laughs> I, I bought that. some freaking overalls to work out in my garden. That's good. I'm <laughs> all about this, like more holistic view of life of like, Books. Books are a funny one. We set our Goodreads. Everybody's going to be, it's end of the year right now. Everybody's going to be setting their Goodreads things. Yep. Think about that with your life expectancy and then think about what books you read. Like consumption is a funny thing. We're, we're all consuming whatever right now. Yep. But if you multiplied your lifespan, like say, say we lived, I don't know, your grandparents figure out your average. Mine lived around 85. Okay. And I'm 33. So you got your, I'm super bad at quick math. So it's like, what, 50 something? We'll so call it good. yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm call, be it, zero 50, help call it 50 for just fun math. Okay, 50. I usually set my reading goal around 25. I can read a book every other week. Okay. That's not that many books left. Yeah. So I'm, true. I'm all of a sudden like, okay, I gotta, I gotta start to limit what I'm actually consuming. I shouldn't read some garbage, you know, bestseller that sucks. Yeah. Not to say we should have fluff fluff's fine every once in a while. Yeah. But to me, I'm like looking at those minutes left and it's like the 4,000 weeks thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you start to look at it as a, as a, I, I am fairly, I'm a realist, but I'm, I'm more optimistic where yeah. I look at glass half full. Mm -hmm. It's actually pretty good to look at life as like glass half empty. It's like, that's got not that timer's going down, not in a bad way, but in a, in a maximizing way of yeah, help what can I go do anyways? Yeah. That was a rant. No, I love that. I think that's the best answer ever. So I don't even know to touch on it. You talked about like when you do the, the weeks, you break down the months you have to live. It goes by faster. I mean, it's a, a time glass. You look at a time glass, you start, it's like, holy shit, that thing's moving so slow. But when it gets towards the end, it looks like it is hauling yeah. ass and it looks like it's like sped up and hasn't there's just less time left yeah right which is a really it's a having a healthy relationship with that is so key and it couldn't have been scripted better because obviously i don't know if you're familiar if you've listened the name of the podcast is today's the day the yeah. whole concept behind that is 
today's kind of all you got. And, and the, and if you can go and live it as though it's all you've got, like tomorrow doesn't matter because it already happened. And, to, and I mean, sorry, yesterday doesn't matter because it already happened. And tomorrow doesn't matter because it might not happen. You'll go and live a much more filled life, fulfilled life, accomplished life, all the above. Yeah. Right. You won't sit there and doom scroll if it's your last day. Right. No shot. You won't go read that book or that magazine. You really don't care to read. You're just killing time. Mm -hmm. which is such a strange concept to me, but I think it's super valuable. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Um, as always, it was a blast for me. I hope you got something out of this. If you got something out of this video of value, share this with a friend and please go show your love. We're on all streaming platforms, including YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. Any ratings, comments, likes, shares, they go a very long way and they make it so I can keep doing these things for you and I would appreciate it greatly. So please go share with a friend. Until next time.